I recall I sat on the porch that night, sipping whiskey, straight and neat, watching tiny goblins and lanterns bright, flitting up and down the street. But I don't recall his approach at all. He just suddenly came into view, walking straight and tall by my garden wall. And I greeted him as I would you. Good evening, soldier. I toasted him. Slake your thirst with some good malt scotch. It's Halloween. It's October the 31st. The kids are all out in the neighborhood and they're drinking some lonely toast to the wee folk there, to my own childhood, to the darkness and the ghosts. He turned and eyed me. I'd never seen his face in my life before. Sure, he said, I'll be happy to toast Halloween. Halloween 1944. Well, he crossed the lawn and he shook my hand and I cheerfully poured him a glass. I assumed from his clothing, he played in a band. He was kilted and glittering with brass. He proposed, the Calgary Highlanders. We downed it. I poured in one more. To the Walker and Causeway, he said, Halloween, 1944. To the what, I inquired, and his eyes grew dim, and a strange look came over his face. And embarrassed, I flushed, and my self-esteem sank, for I felt myself somehow disgraced. The Walker and Causeway, he said it again. It's a roadway, a long, narrow belt of a road, built out over the water and fen to a Dutch island out on the Scheldt. Just a high, built-up roadway, exposed to the wind and the rain and the sleet. God, the first time we saw it, we never supposed we'd be crossing that thing on our feet. It was 2,000 yards long, and each exposed foot of it made it a breeze to defend for the Germans who held it. You see, they could shoot from the roadblock they'd built at their end. I know 2,000 yards might not seem much by day when you're taking a stroll with your sons, but at night, in a fight, it's a long, long way when you're facing an enemy's guns. They told us at first we'd be crossing in boats to assault Middleburg, across the slough, but the mud was as thick as the fear in our throats, and it stuck our assault craft like glue. Yet we had to cross over, we had to attack, and by land there was only one route, and that route was the causeway, straight, long, bare, and black. Well, the Highlanders moved in on foot, under cover of darkness, with no place to halt, no surprise, no maneuvering room, just a mad midnight dash a straight frontal assault into blackness, confusion, and doom. Jerry's mortars and field guns were well zeroed in, and the roadblock machine guns as well. But we had to approach them, engage them, and win. So we charged them like bats out of hell. <laughs> Turn the night into day, and the shell splinters, bullets, and stone fragments turn the air solid, and slaughtered men lay where they fell, lifeless, limp, and alone. 12th Platoon of B Company took the full force of the hellish defensive crossfire. They were out on the front, unprotected, of course, and B Company had to retire. Daybreak came, and the sight of that shell-shattered road would have riven an archangel's brain. But D Company moved forward and took up the load, and the whole place erupted again. How they did it, God knows. But they went all the way where no human could hope to survive, and they captured the roadblock. They carried the day, and the rest of us crossed there alive. Like the light brigade charge of the jaws of death riding into the mouth of hell, they smelt the stink of the demon's breath as their friends and their messmates fell. 
Like the Highlander forebears who fought with pride on the rolling Zulu belt, they faced extinction and stemmed its tide on that causeway over the Scheldt. Like their sister regiment's thin red line on the Balaclava clay, they defied false gods for the narrow spine of the Walkering Causeway. As the Calgary men took St. Julian in the war that had gone before, these ones captured the causeway to Walkeren and distinguished the oak leaf they wore. His voice tailed away, and between us a silence hung. And as I reached for the bottle to charge his glass, I was thinking, he looked too young to have seen the things he said he'd seen. But then shock unhinged my jaw. The chair sat empty where he had been, and the night had turned cold and raw. Well, I jumped up and ran to the garden wall, and I searched the empty street. But I saw no sign of him at all. I heard no sound of feet. Then his voice said clearly, To Walkerin, don't forget, inside my head. And I shivered and turned and went slowly in to a sleepless, comfortless bed. Thank you.